When it comes to what's happening in this country and around the world, the best podcast you can listen to is The Buck Sexton Show. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Who could have thought that when people told Democrats they had to treat Wisconsin like a battleground, they would take it quite so literally? iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to The Buck Saxon Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Candace Owens just knocked out Cardi B and poked the biggest hole yet in the stranglehold entertainment and media have on the minds of black voters in this country. I'm Rob Smith, and on the next episode of Rob Smith is Problematic, we are going to break down why the left uses idiots to reach black America and how Candace Owens just put them all on notice that they cannot do it anymore. Listen to Rob Smith is Problematic on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. On this episode of Newt's World. Obviously, it's overwhelmingly in our interest. This is not a zero-sum game. It's overwhelmingly in our interest that China prosper. Here's the deal. Everybody talks about Biden says that China, if we do what we have to do, China's not a problem. Look. China's in real trouble, man. I spent a lot of time with Xi Jinping. I spent more time with them than any world leader before I left. My son's business dealings were not anything where everybody that he's talking about, not even remotely number one. China is going to eat our lunch. Come on, man. They're not bad folks, folks. But guess what? They're not a they're, they're not, not, they're competition for us. We need to get tough with China. If China has its way, it's going to keep, it's going to keep moving and robbing U.S. firms of our technology, intellectual property. There was a debate here in the United States, and quite frankly, throughout most of the West, is whether a rising China was in the interest of the United States and the wider world. As a young member of the Foreign Relations Committee, I wrote and I said, and I believe then what I believe now, that a rising China is a positive, positive development, not only for China, but for America and the world writ large. Hi, this is Newt. Due to the virus, I'm recording from home. So you may notice a difference in audio quality. On this episode of Newt's World, when then Vice President Joe Biden took a 2013 official trip to China, he brought along his son, Hunter Biden. Shortly thereafter, Hunter Biden's small investment firm received funding from the Chinese for a $1.5 billion private equity fund. This is the remarkable and largely hidden story of the secret financial relationship between the Biden family and the Chinese government and the sinister business deals that enrich them at America's expense. I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Peter Schweitzer, executive producer of the new documentary, Riding the Dragon, The Biden's Chinese Secrets. Peter is the president of the Government Accountability Institute and a best-selling author of three books. I'm going to talk today with a really good friend of mine, Peter Schweitzer, the executive producer of the new documentary, Riding the Dragon, the Biden's Chinese Secrets, about the Biden family's financial gains from the Chinese government. But I also have to say that Peter has taken on both parties He's written a series of fascinating books, including Profiles in Corruption, Secret Empires, and Clinton Cash. He's really somebody with a really good pedigree of doing great investigative work. And Peter is delighted once again to be with you. Wonderful to be with you, Newt. Thanks so much for having me. So, first of all, what got you into looking at Biden and the Chinese? Great question. We kind of stumbled on it. We do a lot of research that involves following the money in Washington. I'm not one who takes the attitude that money in politics is bad. I believe it's a First Amendment right. But when it comes to self-enrichment by political figures or when it comes by foreign entities like the Chinese or the Russians or whoever, I view that as a different matter. And we ran across this sort of obscure website in China that described a meeting that Hunter Biden, the son of the vice president, had with all these top Chinese financial officials. This would be the equivalent of the vice president's son meeting with the head of all the big financial firms on Wall Street 
throw in the Federal Reserve and throw in the Treasury Department. Here was the son of the vice president. We found that very, very curious. So we started poking around and then discovered this web of relationships, this effort by Hunter Biden to secure financial deals, which he was successful in doing with the Chinese government. And this effort took place just as Joe Biden was appointed the point person on U.S. policy towards China by Barack Obama. So we found that very, very curious. And then we spent about nine months poking around to find what we eventually uncovered. How much were you hindered by the Chinese? You know, it's interesting. On the one hand, there's clarity as it comes to disclosure of actual entities that have been set up. So you can actually look at registries of Chinese companies if you know which company you're trying to find. And it will list who is on the board of directors, who has stakes. So that's very, very helpful. On the other hand, Of course, there's not a free press in China, so there's nobody actually reporting on these activities and exposing them. So you have to know what you're looking for in advance. We knew the name of the company that Hunter Biden was involved with, Bohai Harvest, BHR Partners, so we could go to the Chinese government website and we could look who were the owners of that firm and who was on the board of directors. So as you can imagine, in the kind of governance that you get in China, Not a lot of clarity, but there was enough so that we had threads to pull on and really realize how deep this went. What kind of threads do you look for and how do you pull them? Great question, Newt. A couple of things you look for. First, you look for, as I said, timing. And what was interesting about Hunter Biden, we started researching and looking at Hunter Biden's background. And what we found essentially was that every job that he had had in his adult life, was linked to his father's political career. He was either a lobbyist for Delaware entities that wanted something from his father, who of course was a senator from Delaware, or it involved a online gambling company that was in trouble with the Department of Justice. And of course, Joe Biden was on the Judiciary Committee of the Senate. We looked at what Hunter Biden had done in the past, and then suddenly he pops up in China. And this was an anomaly. This is one of the other things we look for, Newt, is sort of fish out of water. We quickly realized Hunter Biden really did not have any background in Chinese deals. And we figured out that this involved a private equity deal, that he had no background in private equity. That, for us, is a very, very strong red flag. In and of and by itself, it doesn't mean a lot, but it does indicate that something is probably amiss. Because... What you're looking for in the case of Hunter Biden with the Chinese is they come together and they form a private equity fund called BHR Partners that is financed by the Chinese government. They're taking money from the Chinese government's pension system and they're giving it to this firm. And you're wondering, why is Hunter Biden there? Why is he on the board of directors? What does he actually bring to the table here? He doesn't bring any expertise. He doesn't bring any background. He doesn't bring any access to financial markets in the United States. So you're looking for anomalies, and then you're trying to look for what are the actual deals that the Chinese government is funding? What are the actual deals that they are doing? And when you realize that they are doing deals to buy firms that have national security or military implications for the West, it becomes pretty clear in my mind why he's there. He's there in a sense to provide some cover or camouflage or to run interference for deals that are potentially very politically loaded or should be politically loaded. So a lot of this is sort of intuition, looking what the fact patterns are, looking for the timing of things, but also trying to figure out what are the anomalies? Why is this a unique deal? And that probably took four or five months. And once you're there, then you can really start digging into the specifics of the deal, what you know about it, how it was structured, the potential funds that he makes, that sort of thing. Now, when you say when you're there, did you actually go to China to do this? We did not. We had help, which I can't name, from a financial firm that had access to Chinese government registrations, uh, corporations. So all of this work was done online. And what we find, Newt, oftentimes is that When I started writing books in the 1990s, the challenge was always finding information, going to libraries, going through books, going through microfiche, for those of us who remember that. 
The problem today really is too much information. There's so much information out there, it's sifting through it, and you're kind of panning for gold. You're trying to get rid of the stones and the rocks, and you're trying to focus on the nuggets. So there's an amazing amount of information that you can garner online, particularly from official government sources, from the accounts of certain companies. But it's a very, very tedious and laborious process because, again, you're going through so much rock to find these nuggets of gold. And most of that, I assume, is actually in Chinese. Yes. A lot of it was in Chinese. Some of it was in English. We use translation services. Sometimes we have people that are translators for us. But really, ultimately, what it was about was stitching together accounts. Some of those came from these Chinese language blog sites where there were individuals involved in these meetings with Hunter Biden. They were parties to these deals, posing for pictures with him, describing who he was. They would always describe him as Hunter Biden, second son of the vice president. That's how he was presented as far as the Chinese were concerned. And then once you know that those meetings take place, you try to figure out who are the other principals in that meeting. Oftentimes they list them. And then you go to the government sites and figure out who they are. And you find out that they're obviously very politically connected, that they're very powerful. And then you look at the accounts of the entity itself. A lot of times when entities feel like what they're doing is not going to be sort of fully exposed, they honestly brag a little bit about what a great deal it is. So BHR, the company where Hunter Biden was on the board of directors himself, actually put in its own media accounts in China the fact that this was a unique deal that nobody else had in China, not Goldman Sachs, not Morgan Stanley, nobody. So sometimes the companies themselves can be very, very helpful in figuring out exactly what's going on. Wasn't he creating a company in the U.S. or being part of a company in the U.S.? Yes. Hunter Biden has been involved in a lot of things. So what this private equity firm, BHR, essentially did, they got $1.5 billion from the Chinese government. And as private equity firms do, they buy stakes in other companies. And what's interesting is when you look at what Hunter Biden's firm was doing, they were hiring firms that were either engaged in producing dual-use technologies, those are technologies that have both civilian and military application, or outright sort of national security-related companies. So, for example, one of the things that the company did, Hunter Biden's firm, was it bought half of an American company called Hennigus in Michigan. The other half was bought by AVIC, which is the Chinese aviation military contractor. So Hunter Biden's firm and AVIC go in and they buy 100% of Hennigus, which is a Michigan-based company that produces anti-vibration technologies. These are technologies used in cars. They can also be used in rockets, things like that. So they acquire this company. And it's a dual-use technology company. And, of course, the concern at the time, the deal was approved by the Obama administration, the concern at the time and remains is that this benefited the Chinese military because anti-vibration technology for rocketry and, and other military systems has been a weakness for Beijing. There was another case where Hunter Biden's firm, BHR, takes a stake. They're actually an anchor investor in a company called CGN, China General Nuclear which is a Chinese nuclear power company, as the name implies. The concern here is that CGN just doesn't have nuclear plants in China. About a year after Hunter Biden's firm buys a stake in the company, CGN is charged by our FBI for stealing nuclear secrets in the United States. And one of their engineers pleads guilty. Mr. Ho, some of the other executives are still facing charges. But what they were trying to do, Newt, was steal nuclear secrets related to the small atomic reactors that are used on U.S. nuclear submarines. And that's a huge military advantage that we have over China. The concern, of course, is with this theft, that advantage has diminished. So he's actually involved not just in companies to make money, but in companies which have as a secondary goal undermining American military superiority. This is a key point. I'm glad you highlighted that because People get, I think, a little bit cynical and they almost expect that there's self-enrichment in politics. This is not 
the sort of rank and file case where a governor gives a road paving contract to his nephew. This is actually far more serious than that, because as you note, Hunter Biden made money on these deals. We don't exactly know how much. The estimates are $30 million or more. But more to the point, this is not victimless corruption. This is corruption that actually damages the United States national security posture. And when you look at the deals that Hunter Biden's firm BHR did, whether it's CGN, whether it's Hennigus, whether it's their involvement in buying a mining company in Africa, of course, there's a big minerals competition going on between the United States and China. Many of these deals, if not all of the deals that Hunter Biden's firm was involved in, had a direct benefit to the Chinese military or to the Chinese strategic posture around the globe. So this is far deeper than just rank and file corruption that has become all too familiar to people. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Join me in the Freedom Hut, the one place where you know you'll get the straight story from a conservative perspective. Joe Biden, somebody who's been a machine politician, the Democrat Party from Delaware for longer than I've been alive. And nobody thought he was impressive. No one thought he had great leadership until about five minutes ago. They're trying to fool you. They're trying to pull off a con, a fraud against America. And Joe Biden is the con man in chief. The biggest names and the heaviest hitters in politics, trust me. So we've done a lot, Buck, and we have some great support. Your viewpoint is very important to me. Very, very important. That's how we got to know each other. Buck Sexton, formerly of the CIA. Buck, it's great to be back on the Buck Sexton Show. iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to the Buck Sexton Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, everybody, it's Gianno Caldwell. You may know me as a political analyst on national TV, but today I'm here to tell you about my new podcast series, Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, the sworn enemy of PC culture, which I know isn't very PC to say these days, but that's why I'm here. I'll interview national newsmakers from all walks of life, internationally renowned guests from across the political spectrum, and real people like you discussing real issues on culture and politics, as well as the controversies that have social media blazing. You know the kinds of controversies that may get me in trouble if the mob ever finds out. Well, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I'm not afraid of a liberal mob. They should be afraid of me. Listen to Out Loud with Gianna Caldwell, launching October 5th on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. That's Out Loud with Gianna Caldwell, launching October 5th on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Time-wise, where is Hunter's Chinese involvement compared to his Ukrainian involvement? Great question. They almost essentially overlap. The Obama-Biden ticket is reelected in November of 2012. And two things happen. Number one, Joe Biden is directed by Barack Obama to be the point person on U.S. policy towards China. The deal with BHR is done in December of 2013. But then something happens two months later in February of 2014, and that is when Vladimir Putin goes into Crimea and triggers the Ukraine crisis. What happens is literally a couple weeks after that, Barack Obama appoints Joe Biden as head of U.S. policy towards Ukraine. And he ends up visiting Ukraine something like seven times over the next several years, literally three weeks after he's the point person on Ukraine policy, Hunter Biden secures his deal with Burisma, the corrupt Ukrainian company, which pays him a million dollars a year to sit on the board of the company, even though he has no background in natural gas or energy or Ukraine. So what we're talking about here, Newt, is over a period of just a few months when sort of the planets align for the Bidens, if you want to be cynical about it, Joe Biden is the point person on China policy and on policy towards Ukraine. 
that gives him enormous sway of what our position is going to be towards those two countries. And within a matter of months, the Biden family suddenly has deals that they really have no qualifications for with the government of China and with powerful oligarchs in Ukraine. It's really an astonishing transaction, as it were, between the Biden family, basically using the political position and power he's been given for the benefit of enriching the family. So are there any other countries that we know of that Hunter got involved with? There are. We know that he had some consulting arrangements with oligarchs in Romania. We know that there were links with the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Kazakhstan. There's also a very, very curious deal that more details are coming out on involving a Russian oligarch named Yelena Baderina. Now, Yelena Baderina was the wife of the longtime mayor of Moscow, who is highly corrupt. She is generally regarded as pro-Putin, and she is also regarded by Western analysts as being deeply tied to Russian organized crime. We know from court documents involving Hunter Biden's business partner, Devin Archer, that according to Devin Archer, Yelena Baderina invested some $200 million into a real estate entity that Hunter Biden was the co-founder of and that Devin Archer was also a co-founder of. Wait a second. $200 million? Yes. $200 okay, so, million. Dollars. So this is a guy who knew nothing about natural gas. He knew nothing about the projects in China. Do we know if he knew anything at all about real estate? No, no background in commercial real estate whatsoever. It's important to point out here, by the way, that the name Rosemont Real Estate Hunter has an investment firm called Rosemont Seneca Partners. Rosemont is the name of John Kerry Teresa Hines estate in Pennsylvania. And this is important because the funding for these companies came in part from the Hines family through Christopher Hines, who is the stepson of John Kerry, who, of course, was the Secretary of State while the time all of this is going. So you can see what kind of an insider deal this was. But you're exactly right. None of these areas are backgrounds that Hunter Biden had expertise in whatsoever. What he did have was a very powerful father who was steering a lot of U.S. foreign policy that was generally not regarded as a strong point for Barack Obama, a point that Barack Obama himself admitted by putting Joe Biden in charge of so much policy. An individual like Yelena Batterina, if you go to WikiLeaks and look at the State Department cables of how they describe her, or you look at just some of the press accounts, she is on the sanctions list that the Trump administration has put out on oligarchs that are not allowed to do business or to come to the United States. She has a long history of association with Russian organized crime figures. And yet you have corporate documents from a court trial laying out that there was an investment made by her into one of Hunter Biden's businesses. What you actually find is that Yelena Batarina's top assistant actually listed himself as an advisor to Hunter Biden's real estate firm while he was also working for Yelena Batarina. So clearly there was a relationship there. And yet, as it comes with so many of these other things, Newt, there seems to be little press curiosity about these kinds of ties. In addition to Hunter, Biden's younger brother, James, also got involved in real estate, didn't he? Yeah. So Frank Biden had a series of deals involving real estate and non-fossil fuel energy projects in both Jamaica and Costa Rica. Add him to the list of Bidens who really had no background into the areas that he went into. But what Frank Biden was successful in doing was securing taxpayer-backed loans for projects in those states. The other brother that he has, James Biden, has a series of deals as well. The most startling occurred in November of 2010, when, of course, Joe Biden is vice president of the United States. He has a big say in Iraqi reconstruction. We find that James Biden joins a company, a construction company, even though he has no background in construction. And within six months, they have landed a multi-billion dollar contract to build homes in Iraq as part of the U.S. reconstruction project there. Do we know if that contract is still valid? No, it's not still valid. In fact, one of the things that happened was they started to execute the contract and it was realized by the people on the ground that 
this firm actually had no ability to execute. So the contract was downsized. But that construction company, again, Joe Biden's brother is the executive vice president of that company. He has no background in construction. They landed a series of other contracts from the State Department and from other federal government agencies as it involved renovation and other projects. So it's, again, another glaring example of clearly how the financial fortunes of the Biden family revolve around the planet Joe. And the moons are the family members who really don't have the skill or the background in these areas, but secure these deals anyway because of who Joe Biden is. Have you happened to yet put together like a large chart that just shows all this stuff? Actually, we have not. You have what I call the Biden Five. These are the five members of the family who have cashed in because of Joe Biden's career. We've talked about Hunter. We've talked about his brother, Frank, with his taxpayer-backed loans in Jamaica and in Costa Rica. We've talked about his brother, James, and the Iraqi contract, and there's other things to go along with that. Then you have his sister, Valerie, who has run his campaigns over the years and made millions of dollars doing so. And then the final one, involves his daughter, Ashley, and her husband. Her husband put together a company called Startup Health, and they literally launched the company in the Oval Office. The son-in-law gave an interview where he describes how he was talking to Joe Biden, the vice president, about this company he wanted to start, which was basically to provide access for healthcare startups to federal government agencies. And Joe Biden said, well, come on in. I'm going to have you talk to Barack about it. They come in, they talk to him in the Oval Office. It's then set up so this new company that barely exists, that barely has a website, becomes a featured participant in a healthcare data conference that the federal government holds that brings all the big healthcare players around the country into play. So those are the Biden five. And you're right, a chart I think would really help describe to people and visualize to people the extensive nature of this. I've never seen a family with that many family members engaged in corrupt or crony behavior. The most I've ever seen before that was three. This is five, and this is far more extensive. I think if you had a Biden five chart that people could print off the web or something, they would have a lot of takers. As I'm sitting here listening to you talk and trying to envision it, There's really a lot of stuff here. I think part of what slows down the news media is that all of this requires real work to validate it. And they're not big on doing real work now. (laughs) I think you're absolutely right. I think part of it is the media seems to have joined the resistance, as they call themselves. But I think the other component is exactly what you're saying. It's the complexity. Some of them have so many stories that they have to produce every day but others are just lazy. They don't want to do the work and the heavy lift that goes with looking under rocks and confirming these facts. Candace Owens just knocked out Cardi B and poked the biggest hole yet in the stranglehold entertainment and media have on the minds of black voters in this country. I'm Rob Smith, and on the next episode of Rob Smith is Problematic, we are going to break down why the left uses idiots to reach black America and how Candace Owens just put them all on notice that they cannot do it anymore. Listen to Rob Smith is Problematic on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. When I was speaker in 96, we got into a fairly substantial Clinton-Gore scandal of taking money from the Chinese communists, with my favorite moment being Gore going to a Buddhist monastery of monks who had pledged vows of poverty and collecting a couple hundred thousand dollars. I just noticed this week a report that came out that Act Blue, the big democratic fundraising machine, 48.4% of their donations come from people who do not list an employer or say that they have a job. Biden is 49.6% that come from people who say that they don't have a job or that they don't have an employer. Now, by contrast, the Republican model, when red, 
is 4%, and the Trump campaign is 2.6%. So you have literally more than 12 times the share of AgBlue not able to report an employer. And the question has been raised whether, in fact, this is a device for simply laundering money from foreign donors. As an investigative reporter, what would your reaction be just to seeing those kind of numbers? Well, they're shocking. And if I read it correctly, Newt, I think that data came from 2019. So that's when the unemployment rate was incredibly low. It is very, very concerning. Demands, I think, a further, deeper look. Because when you make a contribution, you are actually required to list your employer and you're not supposed to lie about it. And I don't think people are going to lie about putting the fact that they're unemployed. If you're retired, you put retired. But I think even more to the point, this has been a long-standing troubling issue that has not really been addressed in a substantial way, and that is the vulnerability of online fundraising to the manipulation of foreign entities. Back in 2008, when Barack Obama was running for office, the Washington Post actually ran a piece where they described how individuals that were enthusiastic fans of Barack Obama's made, I think in one case, it was $13,000 in contributions, even though the cap, I think at the time was 2,600 for the primary. And this individual made those donations just by using their same credit card, but by just using different fictitious names for the donation. It was a way to subvert the cap of how much money you could give. So it's been demonstrated to happen before. When you put a sophisticated foreign operator behind it, whether they're Chinese, whether they're Iranian, from wherever, you have a serious vulnerability there. And the problem is that some campaigns just want to look the other way. I mean, it's in their financial interest to look the other way and pretend that it's not a problem and that it's not occurring. So there's nobody really watching the hen house in this case. Well, it strikes me that both on the financial donation side and on the family investment side, Everything has conspired to encourage Biden to look the other way, that he has no vested interest in either getting to the truth about his family or getting to the truth about donations that may be coming from foreign countries. I think you're exactly right. And we know for a fact that Team Biden has lied about the ties involving China and Joe Biden's knowledge of them. Joe Biden, initially, when these reports came out, said that I never discuss any of the business ties that my son has, which sort of strains credulity because in part they have talked for decades about how close they are. But even more to the point, they flew together on Air Force Two to China, which is from Washington, D.C., an 18-hour trip, whatever it is. And the suggestion that they never discussed it is just remarkable. But then after he insisted on making that point repeatedly, it came out that Hunter Biden admitted that he had talked to his father about at least the Ukraine deal and that he had introduced his father to a Chinese business partner on the official trip in December of 2013. So I agree with you. There's not an incentive for him to discuss these things because it's been good for his family, but they've also tried to, in effect, cover it up and minimize it. And I think the point that needs to be made here, I mean, you make it in your book, Trump versus China, and we need to remind ourselves, we've been talking in this conversation about China. What we're really talking about is the Chinese Communist Party and the fact that they use these Leninist techniques to try to curry favor and subvert what they view as their enemies, leadership. And that's what I think this is. This really is an effort for them to get Joe Biden to be softer on China. And it, I think, by any definition has worked. Because when you look at his rhetoric, he's on an island by himself in describing that China's not a threat, they're not a challenge, they're nothing to worry about. Even Barack Obama and Ben Rhodes, his national security advisors, have said that China represents a challenge and a threat to the United States. Joe Biden is unique and on an island by himself in saying otherwise. And I have to believe that is tied directly to the fact that that same China has made his family wealthy. Well, I think that's a big part of it. Have you tried to quantify how much Chinese money is involved 
and how much Ukrainian money is involved in terms of Hunter? We don't know what Hunter made. One of the things that I have called for is a requirement that elected officials right now, if Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever has $10,000 in General Electric stock, they're required to disclose that. But if their adult child does a $1.5 billion private equity deal with a foreign rival government, there's no disclosure requirements. And one of the things that I had a conversation with Senators Cruz and Lee a couple of years ago that they posited was, what about simply requiring that politicians disclose if any family members have deals with foreign governments? Again, people can lie on those forms, but at least requiring some clarity. What we know in Hunter's case, Newt, is that he got a million dollars a year from Ukraine over about three and a half years. In the case of China, we don't know. There's an estimate by a professor at the University of Chicago Business School. He told factcheck.org that he believes that Hunter's stake in the Chinese firm was probably $30 million. That could have gone up, but there's no real way of knowing. The bottom line is that Hunter Biden's not doing them for free. He's doing them to be compensated, and the Chinese want him to be well compensated because they want the Bidens hooked and on the line. And that's what I think they have. Two things. One, I do think you could write a requirement which would make it a felony to not fill it out accurately. So in that sense, you could have an enforceable item. Yes. The other is I'm going back to Joe Biden's basic honesty. I'm thinking about this as I'm a father and a grandfather. So one of my daughters walks in and happens to have made a million dollars a year. Now, would I have noticed this? <laughs> and then she says, oh, by the way, I got this new deal where I'm now managing a billion five in Chinese money. Now, would I have noticed that? Again, Biden has been acting very strangely, and it's conceivable that he either never knew or didn't remember. But it doesn't strike me as very plausible. Somebody who doesn't notice if their kid is picking up a million dollars a year from Ukraine and maybe picking up as much as 30 million a year from the Chinese. I mean, it had to have affected Hunter's lifestyle. The whole thing's not believable. I agree 100%. And we also know, for example, in the case of Burisma, when Hunter joined the board, it was announced in April of 2014. So it was there in the public realm, and Joe Biden didn't do anything about it. And when you talk about the relationship between Hunter and Joe Biden, there's obviously the lifestyle evidence, but there's also the fact that we now know, thanks to our friends at Judicial Watch, that Hunter Biden was spending a lot of time in China. There were some five trips that he took during the first term of the Obama administration. And it sort of occurs to me, given that Hunter and Joe Biden have talked about the fact that they are on the phone all the time with each other because they're so close, it would occur to me that where are you, son? Oh, I'm coming back from China, or I'm in China. Oh, what are you doing in China? I mean, those are the natural, normal conversations you would have with your daughter, I would have with my kids, anybody would have with a family member. And the lying that has followed their efforts to try to quell this story indicate that they are desperately trying to cover this up. Joe Biden wants you to believe he's so close to his son, they have such an intimate daily relationship that he didn't notice millions of dollars. And he didn't notice the trips to Ukraine and China. And he is really mystified why anybody would doubt him because after all, he's such a good guy. I think this is gonna grow and continue. And I think your research is gonna be a major part of the story of 2020. And I just wanna thank you. Well, thank you, Newt. It's been great to have been on with you. We're going to keep pressing on and doing the research that we always do and uncovering this stuff and letting the American people know what's going on. Thank you to my guest, Peter Schweitzer. You can watch the new documentary, Riding the Dragon, the Biden's Chinese Secrets, for free on our show page at newtsworld.com. Newt's World is produced by Gingrich 360 and iHeartMedia. Our executive producer is Debbie Myers and our producer is Garnsey Islam. The artwork for the show was created by Steve Penley. Special thanks to the team at Gingrich 360. Please email me with your questions at gingrich360.com questions. 
I'll answer a selection of them in future episodes. If you've been enjoying Newt's World, I hope you'll go to Apple Podcasts and both rate us with five stars and give us a review so others can learn what it's all about. On the next episode of Newt's World, as part of our election 2020 series, I'll give you my take on the first presidential debate between President Donald Trump and Vice President Joe Biden. I'm Newt Gingrich. This is Newt's World. When it comes to what's happening in this country and around the world, the best podcast you can listen to is The Buck Sexton Show. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Who could have thought that when people told Democrats they had to treat Wisconsin like a battleground, they would take it quite so literally? iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to The Buck Sexton Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Candace Owens just knocked out Cardi B and poked the biggest hole yet in the stranglehold entertainment and media have on the minds of black voters in this country. I'm Rob Smith, and on the next episode of Rob Smith is Problematic, we are going to break down why the left uses idiots to reach black America and how Candace Owens just put them all on notice that they cannot do it anymore. Listen to Rob Smith is Problematic on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts.